All right, guys, welcome back to part three of this week's Yawa. You ask and we answered. If this is your first time to our channel, make sure and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. And we're gonna get started right away answering your questions. This one is one that we get asked similarly a lot, so I wanted to make sure that we hit on it. One man mosh pit. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on pointing drills for somebody who has very limited access to live birds? I have a 10 month old Brittany and would really like to work this spring and summer to get him to be steady on point next fall. The only time I can really use live birds is if I catch pigeons or buy quail chucker from a local preserve. Yep. So first of all, I want to say birds make a bird dog and they're definitely necessary for training. You can't really cut corners and accomplish the same goals without using them. So consider buying some birds or catching pigeons. I mean, that that's honestly what we do to train dogs. We buy birds from bird breeders because we don't have uh, breeding pens and things like that. We don't raise our own birds. We buy them. And then same with our pigeons. We used to do that. We used to catch them. Uh, right now we have a very good supplier of some feral pigeons as well as a very well-established homing pigeon coop. So we don't have to go out catching frequently or anymore, but that's where we started. And that's really what you're going to need to do. And you're going to have to commit that uh, time, money, and resources to training your dog. It's not just a magic freebie mm -hmm. that you can do it without any expense or without any resources. So unfortunately, birds are going to make a bird dog. Um, and then there are definitely drills and things that you can do that are going to help your dog become more steady, uh, including well training. Well training, that's what I was going to say, which doesn't necessarily require birds throughout that entire process. Uh, no. We typically utilize some homing pigeons in the beginning of our woe training drills, uh, but you can get there without having as many birds necessary. But Absolutely. birds make a bird dog. Awesome. Uh, next question, Brandon.Banton. Uh, when doing bird work with the GSP or any pointing dog, when do you decide to shoot birds over the dog during the training process? He is properly introduced to gunfire already, and we are now on to birds and launchers. He does all the things you would expect a young dog uh, beginning bird work to do. Point some, hold some longer than others, and we have to launch some on scent acknowledgement where he doesn't establish a point. Do we move on to formal woe training so we have more steadiness on point before shooting birds or continue his exposure to birds to build more confidence in his nose? Or is there something else that I should be doing or looking for before shooting birds over him? Okay. I know that was a really long question, but it was an excellent question. And you're recognizing all of the things that are happening in your sessions. Yeah. Uh, videos are really great ways to be able to see all of this that's happening, but you did a great job of explaining what you're seeing. Absolutely. There's a couple of things that go into that here. First of all, you said properly induced to birds, properly induced to gunfire. So you've checked off those two boxes. The next is going to be he, our recommendation is that the dog is going to be pointing and holding steady enough for you to at least get into gun range. Um, usually ideally getting all the way to the birds to quote unquote flush them um, is my goal before I start shooting birds over the dog, especially clearing that boundary where you're breaking past them and you're making that advancement without the dog trying to move with you. Now, we're not talking about coming in uh, here's a dog on point. We're not talking about walking right next to them. You always want to come out so that you're not pressuring them to go with you, but still being able to break that barrier where the dog can see you and you're moving toward the bird and them not move. That would be the goal. If you are struggling with that or you're having that inconsistent, we have to kind of look at are the situations being 100% set up, right? Or did the dog run with the wind at its back and run over the bird? Or you know, some of that stuff is going to happen in any training environment. Nothing is perfect, but we have to look at that. Are they steady in the right situations or is it that inconsistent? The and next looking at the potential of environmental changes, like Ethan mentioned, yeah. the wind direction, but also the wind speed can be a harder thing for a young undeveloped nose to be consistent with. Um, really heavy winds or no winds at all. Yeah. So tough. there's a lot of environmental factors that can go into this yep. as well. But if you come down and you say, you know, all of these things seem similar, we have good crosswinds, we have good situations, all of the stuff. And he's you've just got good timing. Yeah. You've got good timing. You've got good timing. Um, 
but yet you're still seeing inconsistency with pointing. I mean, you could probably at that point move into either continuing down the track of pigeons that are flying away or birds that are flying away without being shot, or you could work on some formal woe training. This would be one that I would really love to see a series of three or four birds. Um, that we can worked. see all of the things that you just were to, explaining. Yeah, just to help double check and, and steer you in the right direction on that. Because also, if you just keep on the path and try and continue building that steadiness the way you have been, and there's something that's not quite right about your situation, your timing's a little off, um, the, the crosswind isn't quite right for your dog, you can actually cause potentially more problems and that steadiness is never going to get better. It's going to get worse because they're going to be like, I'm now on takeout mode. Uh, so if you could video, we could see, but also keep in mind that keeping on the course, if things aren't necessarily being done right, could just cause more problems. Um, so it may be something that the formal woe training would be necessary. And if you get the chance to shoot that video, the best place to send those over to us is on Patreon, where we're set up to take a look at your videos, answer your questions, and we do that on the daily. So great question. Uh, next one is from, do you want to do this one? Yeah, I'll read okay. this one. He's giving me a chance to read one. Thanks. From Paul Granillo. I think this was from Facebook. I have a four-year-old female lab. When training or hunting in the uplands, she always stops to mark bushes. How do I stop this? I already limit water before training. When I get a new pup, how can I present, how can I prevent this from happening? Thank you. So good question. I know that you're recognizing there's an issue there, which is number one. However, I would caution the you first to- first step to recovery is admitting that there's a problem. Right. We're going to try and help you with this. Second of all, though, I would caution you to limiting your dog's water when they're going to be exerting themselves. It's not something we necessarily want to do. We've talked about in previous Yawas, you know, you don't want to let your dog tank up because they can overwater themselves, uh, but they shouldn't be restricted from water prior to training sessions mm -hmm. uh, to try and prevent an issue like marking that's happening. You could because, end up with a bigger issue like severe dehydration or something. Right. Like and water is very important for recovery and proper hydration prior to exertion is important as well. Um, and I would say, honestly, that your issue is not overhydration. If your dog's not having accidents at four years old anywhere else and they're just marking, that's a behavior issue in and of itself, not that they're overwatering themselves. So the problem is the development of that behavior. And we've seen this happen in training and with dogs that we have to interrupt this behavior. We have to say, this isn't okay, move yeah. along. Uh, you get a dog that goes out into the field and they pee and you're like, well, they haven't been out for a while. They need a potty break. I give them one. Then if they go to the next bush and they're like lifting their leg for males or females mark too. Like you said, your female's doing it. We've seen females mark too. And it's going to go for round two. I just use the collar, vibrate typically and say, okay, give them a little buzz, redirect their focus. Let's keep moving. You don't get a chance to pee. And I usually go, come on, let's go and give them a little verbal cue and encouragement to keep moving. So that would be something that you could try even with your dog now, but definitely with your young dog, redirecting their focus if they're trying to follow in her footsteps of yeah. I pee on this bush, then I pee on this bush, and I don't actually hunt. Um, a couple other things is sometimes dogs get bored because they don't find a lot of birds, and then they're like, well, I'm going to do this because yeah. it seems like the next best, next best thing to them. So making sure, especially when you start introducing and training your new puppy, that you're getting an opportunity on birds could help that problem as well. Yeah. And I think that we see it more in a training situation than an actual hunting situation, unless that hunting situation involves no birds, you know, like there are places and we, I had multiple trips this year that I went hunted three, four, five hours. We didn't have any contacts, you know, it was just maybe somebody had already hunted the spot or whatever, but, um, those are the situations where dogs are going to get bored hunting. But in a training situation, a lot of times you're, you you end up utilizing a field that's quote unquote dirty and that. When know, we mean dirty, it means that other dogs have recently been in their training, other birds have been planted, that sort of thing. So those kind of things can end up pulling the dog's focus, especially if they lack a little bit of desire for the task at hand. Now, things um, that can go into that, and I'm not saying this is this with your dog, but it is with dogs that I've seen before. If the dog is overweight, um, that can end up pulling them to have less drive for the activity. 
And then they focus on other things like, well, this is what I can do. So I'm going to just pee here and there and tootle around. Um, and then the last is through that development process, like Kat was mentioning, um, we put a little more emphasis on our young dogs um, learning to hunt and run. And we do that on um, sometimes like a four-wheeler ATV. Now, depending on where your training grounds are, you may not have this option. But if you can, it kind of keeps them moving and if they try and stop to pee on the third bush, you just keep You're putzing them and in say, the dust. come on. And they don't want to get left behind. So little puppy on, they learn, hey, we got to keep moving. And when we're in the field, we hunt and work hard. And I think all of those things wrapped together is going to get you the results that you're looking for. Yeah. And definitely don't think that, oh, well, I don't have an ATV or a four wheeler. So I'm going to do this with my truck. It's a bad decision because all, there's a lot of cringe. blind spots on a truck, especially around yeah. dogs. And I see that happen. I see videos on Facebook and things like that all the time that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, look, my dog can do 29 miles an hour. That would be horrible. So that's not something we're recommending. Please don't think that. Um, but free runs where they can learn to hunt and focus on that. And then when we get dogs that are finally to the point of when we hit the field, all we're doing is hunting and they're driven for that. They won't come to, to us to get pet. People are like, oh, well, your dog doesn't want to get pet in the field. No, they're working. Getting pet is for in the house. Um, as well as people are like, well, I can't run my dogs together because my females in heat and things like that. We run our dogs in heat with our intact males too, because they can focus on field work and ignore that. So I'm not saying run your dogs that are in heat and intact together and have a potential breeding happen, but we have enough faith in our dogs and control over the situation that I know that they're not going to be bothered by a female in heat. They're going to still focus on their job. Uh, they run up to sniff. You say, Hey, get out of here. Go Same on. with if they stop to mark. Yep. Get out of here. Yep. Go, get to work. So uh, great question though. Uh, Jeremy Wybush, Wybush, at what age do you really start working on the hunting side of training? I've got a four month old male. He's doing everything with obedience training, sit, stay, working on retrieving, doing good when he's by himself. So low distraction environments. I want him to be good and a good all around dog. And I don't want to push him too fast. And he seems to have a lot of prey drive when I play fetch and hide pheasant wings for him. Just wondering if this is a good sign to push forward or keep on keeping on with obedience stuff. Uh, it's a great question. And I think that you made a very valid point about not trying to move too fast because we all get excited and we want to start seeing the bird work and you shouldn't be moving that bird work unless you have a solid foundation. So the next thing would be, um, it all depends on if you feel like you have that solid foundation with obedience work, then absolutely you're ready to move into starting to do some bird work. Just don't overdo it. So when we typically are developing our dogs and if you follow along with that series, you know, those are the order that we're doing those training sessions and that's it. So you will see, we do an obedience thing, an obedience thing, an obedience thing, and then there's some bird work and then more obedience and some other sessions and obedience and obedience. And then there's some bird work. So they may be getting bird work once a week or more, once every other week through that puppy stage. And that keeps it really, really exciting for them, um, which is also a good thing. So, and I know you're asking what age, but it's more about, like Ethan said, those check boxes that you've accomplished these things prior to moving on to that. Um, and then the other thing that I just want to mention um, that sometimes gets done improperly is I'm hiding pheasant wings for him. Please don't hide the wings for them and then want your dog to try and go out and point them. And no uh, pointing. That's, I mean, people try and cut corners when they can't get access to live birds by using dead birds or wings or things like that and think that that's going to help establish their dog learning how to point. Well, those do not smell the same as a live bird. They're dead. You don't want your dog thinking that that's what they do is they go out and they point dead things and dead birds. Uh, we need them to point live bird scent. So um, people sometimes hide pheasant wings for the dog to go out, search, and then retrieve. Sure, hide those, put them on bumpers, things like that, but don't try and get them to be pointing them. Um, perfect. Great question. I'm going to read one now. Ethan's guide got on this like reading question role and won't get, give me a second to get in there. Okay. So from two boobs on, I'm so sorry. I probably pronounced that terribly from Facebook. Uh, with your experiences for hunting wild birds, who has the advantages and is a little better, a natural hunting dog with basic obedience, a finished title dog in NAVDA or AKC or a field trial dog. 
This is a good question. And I definitely think that it's going to be controversial, but you are asking in our experience and our opinion. So that's what we're going to go with. Field trail dogs suck. No, I'm just just kidding. (laughs) I'm just teasing. Uh, So like I mentioned in a different question about, I think that there's importance for obedience to be an aspect of all hunting dog training. Uh, That goes to, that can carry over to um, those higher levels of testing in NAVDA and AKC expect an exceedingly high level of obedience and steadiness. And that steadiness is obedience as well as there's cooperation and things like that involved in achieving those high standards. And I think that if a dog can excel at those high levels, it means, um, and I say excel, not just get titled in those things. Um, sometimes I've seen dogs that squeak by and it takes them 30 passes or 30 runs or 40 runs to become a master hunter. Well, I wouldn't say that they excelled at that high level. I would say that they finally got there. Um, so when they excel at those higher levels of testing, I think that they are going to make more quality hunting dogs because they're going to be more obedient and not just necessarily potentially out there hunting for themselves. I also think that this question could be opinion based in a sense of what kind of hunting you're doing and where you're doing that hunting. Yeah. That's Um, the biggest part of it is, um, each of those dogs kind of represents a different, um, a different situation or a different style. So yeah, typically field trial dogs are going to cover that open ground, that bigger country better than a closer working dog that ran through a hunt test. And that not always, but that can sometimes help you find more birds. If you're in those big open countries without you having to cover all that open ground yourself, uh, like Ethan was out in Montana hunting and they had some big open country and some rolling Hills. And he's like, man, I'm glad my dogs are covering a lot of ground not maybe a field trial quality run, but definitely covering enough ground that he didn't have to walk over to that hill and then that hill and then that hill and wear himself out. He let the dogs work their butts off, which is what they love to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what what do you have to say on that? Uh, well, I would say that a natural hunting dog with obedience work would be consider a, a standard meat dog. And a lot of people kill a lot of birds over meat dogs. Um, so there's no issues with that. It's, is it better or worse than your Navdra AKC dog or field trail dog? I, I, my only point with the differences in there would be if you look at how those tests are laid out, this is where as much as run in the field trial aspect of things could get you some more fines or some more exposure in a bigger piece of country in the puppy division of that. The goal is not even to uh, point birds. It's just to run. It's evaluating run and the potential for them to go on to the next level. Because all of the puppy tests are to evaluate potential, right? So in that, you're evaluating run, which to me says that there's a slight disconnect from true hunting dog involved Searching with purpose and being productive and finding these birds. That would be personal opinion. And then when you look at Navda and AKC, um, you have a similar puppy test as far as um, steadiness. Steadiness is goes. similar. Um, but then with the Navda portion, you're incorporating versatility. So a tracking portion and a water portion. So if you're just looking for a bird dog, I would say, you know, it's, but it does ask about finish the highest level of achievement, right? No. A finish title dog. So I made the assumption of highest the level. highest level. Yeah. So, but even, even that, I, I would say that Navda probably requires the most obedience. AKC is a close second at that highest level. I mean, because you've got to be pretty dang steady. Um, but then the Navda aspect of things, you've got to be pretty a really, obedient. And I mean, a really strong retriever, yes. very polished, finished retrieve. Um, and I was going to ask, isn't there some trials that there isn't even a retrieving portion in or some breeds. Yes. And he didn't specifically say short hairs. So, you know, when you're looking at a field trial dog that they're not even expected and necessarily need to retrieve in those games, well, that's not going to make a great hunting dog to me. I don't think most Brittany stakes are retrieving stakes and most pointer like English pointer stakes are retrieving stakes. Now that somebody can correct me on that. I'm not hundred percent sure, but, but to me, I need a retriever. I need a dog that's willing to retrieve those birds that I'm shooting for him to be a great hunting dog. Um, Which is why we play the games that we do. They most accurately represent what we're trying to produce. And they're going to represent the type of dog we want to hunt behind. So I think that if you 
just work on the same basics and don't title your dog, you can still have an excellent hunting dog, Mm -hmm. but they should still be trying to be trained and worked towards those same expectations. Um, Maybe not steadiness in the field for a steady to wing shot and fall, like we've talked before for an actual meat hunting dog, but um, having still, still steadiness and obedience in the field. The last little thing that I can touch on that is nothing outweighs the exposure of actually hunting wild birds. For so sure. if you have all the titles, but the dogs never hunted, that meat dog's going to out hunt them always. Same thing with all of the rest of it. So if you then take, take that meat dog or the hunting dog with some obedience, whatever, and you apply all of the rules that are involved in those, you're going to have the best of the best situation, but you need um, you truly need that experience and there is nothing that substitutes for wild bird experience. 100%. And that is a very good point that Ethan just made. You need hunting experience. And I think that we've both seen this, that sometimes your dog training hobby and your expectations of meeting these high levels of testing is potentially going to ruin your hunting dog because people think, well, I'm working on this steadiness and I can't let them break to, you know, hunt when we're hunting, they have to stay steady to wing shot and fall. So I have to maintain that during hunting season, or I just train, train, train all the time on these crappy little preserve birds. And so sometimes we say putting too much emphasis on testing, but not giving the opportunity to hunt and gain that experience could put you at a disadvantage of creating an actual dog that you want to hunt behind and enjoy and not just test, 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 train, train, train. Didn't think you'd hear that today, did you? Your dog training hobby is ruining your bird dog, potentially. All right, last question. Working conditioning uh, my Brittany to range a little closer. He is checking back more now. Any advice on keeping him closer without calling him right back to me? Um, it's This is a good one, and it won't take too long, I think, to go into it. Um, Brittany's um, are... we actually just talked about birdies. A lot of times bred or originally bred for field trials, but specific dogs are going to have desires to run specific distances. That's just a natural thing that's bred into them. Dogs to range further or range closer. Um, So you are fighting against natural tendencies. You can work through that with conditioning. Like you used the word working, conditioning my dog to stay closer. Um, We utilize vibrate in that situation or enough stimulation to pull focus. But as soon as the dog's back where you feel comfortable, let go of it. And there's no more um, interaction other than that. And they'll figure out pretty quick that, all right, I'm coming back because he's talking to me with the caller. And then now I don't hear it anymore. I can go back to what I'm doing. And that's a, a silent and easy way to handle them into range. But you are pretty consistently going to have to stay on that if you ever want to truly make progress to the point you're going to have gonna, to very much condition that. Yes, it'll be hard. Yep. It'll be hard to fight against that, which is why we we recommend getting with a dog that is um, being finding, bred by... Yeah, yeah finding yeah, a breed and breeder that are going to match your goals and hunting styles with the dog that's going to meet that. Yep. Great question, though. Just stay on it. You'll get there. Thanks for tuning in for part three of our Yawa this time. And I'm Kat, the dog trainer. I'm the guy with the pink gun. We'll be back next week. Thanks, guys.